Welcome back everyone to the Dark Forest. A special shout out to Carlito and Christopher Clough for chipping in and helping out with this whole process. Now, we are back in business, and tonight is about to get spooky. If you have a scary story you would like to submit, email it to me at zackbabytv at gmail.com. Make sure you smash that thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't. Now, let's get spooky. Recently, I got a vacation for my work. Two beautiful weeks of relaxation and self-care just for me. Of course, COVID forced me to change my initial plan of traveling and actually doing stuff, but free time is always welcomed in my book. I spent most of my days and nights playing video games or binging series and movies. As usual, this also caused my sleep schedule becomes an irregular mess. I would go to sleep and wake up at all hours of the day or night, which put me on the receiving hand of a lot of judgment from my roommates and best friends, Nicholas and Jess. One night, I woke up a bit after 3 a.m., I had just had around six hours of sleep and was totally parched. Not wanting to wake up anyone, I tiptoed into the kitchen, keeping all the lights off. I had been living in this house for four years now. I could navigate it with my eyes closed. With a glass of water filled to the brim in hand, I started tiptoeing around back to where I came from. As I was walking back to my room, a chill ran down my spine. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but this weird sensation filled my body like my guts were telling me something was wrong. Worry of my surroundings, I stood in the darkness of my living room trying to understand the source of this feeling. Failing to comprehend what was happening, I dismissed the feeling as nothing more than a product of my half-asleep mind. Being alone in the dark certainly helped my brain fill every corner of my house with shadow monsters and spooky ghosts. My eyes had just adjusted to the darkness by now, revealing the truth of the monsters and ghosts as being common objects. Looking around the room with half a smile plastered on my face as I laughed at myself for being scared of the dark, I noticed a person standing under the streetlight in front of our house. I felt safe inside, so instead of fear, my head was filled with questions about who we could be and what was the purpose of being there at night. Curiosity made me stare at him, trying to understand the mystery that he now represented in my mind. Anyways, with no lights turned on, I was practically invisible to the outside. I think it was a man, but his morphology wasn't clear from that distance. He was wearing dark jeans, a black hoodie, and black gloves. He was just standing there under the street lamp looking down. I remember thinking to myself, what the hell is this weirdo doing, with a light chuckle? My false sense of security made the situation nothing more than a funny joke I could tell Nicholas and Jess in the morning. It all took a turn when he slowly lifted his head like a robot being activated for the first time. His face was in sight, but I couldn't see any of his features from where I stood. I took a step towards the window and then stopped. His head started moving from left to right, up and down, taking his time like he was scanning our house looking for something. When he stopped, my curiosity was immediately replaced by fear. He was staring at the living room window at me. There's no way he could see me. You can't see me. You can't see me. I whispered in the dark, trying to convince myself. Yet somehow, I knew he could see me. What now? What will his reaction be? I have no idea how long we watched each other without any movement. The anticipation started rising, and my heart beat with it. It felt like out-of-body experience watching myself staring at him and he at me. Then, in a flash, he sprinted towards our front door. Letting go of the glass I was holding, I started to run towards the door to make sure it was indeed locked. I didn't even hear it crashing into a million pieces on the floor as my survival instinct was screaming at me to get to the door. 
At that moment, I got a view of him under my porch light. I couldn't make out his features because there weren't any for me to see. He wore an entirely white mask hiding his identity. I stared at him while he took a step back, and another, and another, still looking at me before he sprinted again towards the left of the house. The back door, I murmured before running myself for the only other access he could use. Again, the door was locked. In my head, I thanked Jess's OCD behavior about safety. Again, he appeared and tried to open the door once. When he couldn't enter, he took a step back like earlier, but this time, he raised his left hand showing three fingers before lowering one. He then walked away in a nonchalant demeanor. I followed him with the windows until he was out of sight. I collapsed on myself and started bawling like a baby, proceeding to wake up Nicholas and Jess in the process. Between my tears and wheezing, I explained what happened. Jess hugged me, while Nicholas was upset for me not screaming to wake them both up. I was too shocked to answer him. But if the sound of glass shattering and me sprinting around the house didn't wake them up, I doubt screaming would have. We proceeded to call the police to tell my story for the second time that night, but the cops never found anything and only said that they would patrol the area more often. I wish I could say that was it, that I lived to tell the tale and write a pretty the end to my story. But in retrospect, that was merely the prelude to my torment. The next day, I was still stressed, but fairly over it. As scary as it was at the time, it was only a failed home invasion attempt. The only thing that bothered me was him lowering his finger. What was that about? I mumbled out before being interrupted by Nicholas. Crazy people do crazy stuff, Nat. Don't torture yourself trying to understand, and just get over it. Empathy wasn't one of Nicholas's strong points, and at that moment, I really wanted his face to meet a chair. Still, I tried to follow his advice and focus my mind on other things, but it didn't stop me from waking up around 3 a.m. again. As soon as I opened my eyes, I felt it. That gut feeling again telling me I wasn't safe. My first thought was that I was having some kind of PTSD from the night before, so I did some breathing exercises to try to calm down. My chest felt heavy, like weight was sitting on it, and I cried to breathe in. I timed my breathing, counting every second of inhalation and expiration, just to focus my mind on something. After a couple of minutes, I realized no amount of breathing exercises didn't make the feeling go away. All I knew was that I was in danger somehow. I sat alone in the dark, now on alert, trying to convince myself again that I was only experiencing residual feelings from the night before. That's when my eyes wandered to my closed blinds. I wondered if the man was there again. What if he's waiting for me? What if I open the blinds and all I see is his face pressed upon the glass? Those thoughts plagued my mind for a minute before I decided that the only way I could go back to sleep was to make sure I was safe and that meant looking outside and hopefully see nothing. I rose a shaking hand towards the edge of my mirror. Just a little push would let me see outside, and at the same time exposing me to it. My awareness put a stop to my already low momentum. I didn't want to take any risk. So with my back against the wall, I raised my phone behind the blinds and recorded a video of what was going on outside. Just a couple of seconds of recording right before hopping back in the safety of my bed, like some invisible monster would snatch my feet if I stood too long. I stared at my phone, my thumb hovering over the play button. I think my instinct was trying to tell me not to watch that video, and just go back to trying to sleep, but my fear decided otherwise. I took a deep breath and reviewed the footage. To my horror, the man was there already scanning every window in the house looking for whatever he wanted, which I was assuming was me. I curled into a ball, feeling terror overwhelm me. I took my phone and dialed 911, but the line wouldn't connect. Every other application I tried wasn't working either. Tears filled my eyes. 
I needed someone to help me. I couldn't face this alone. Desperate. I started to crawl out towards Nicholas's bedroom. I didn't want to scream to wake him up in case the crazy guy would hear me. Standing up was also not an option. I needed to be impossible to see from outside. Like my leg had been suddenly disabled, I moved forward, one pull at a time towards the next room while still being mindful of where my gaze would land upon, hoping not to see the man staring at me with his fearless mask. Exhausted and panicked, I reached my roommate's room. Nicholas, wake up. The crazy guy is here. He's back again. I whispered loudly as I started to get up. The only answer I got was my heart pumping away in my ears as I noticed his bed was empty. I had seen him go to bed after he wished me a good night. He was supposed to be here. There wasn't anywhere else he could be. My mind immediately went to Jess. I had to make sure she was safe. Throwing away discretion, I ran towards the stairs' basement. I couldn't help but let a small sign of relief when I found her in her bed snoring away. Jess! Jess! The guy is back, and I can't find Nick anywhere. I think something may have happened to him. In my panicked state, I shook her violently by her shoulders, but neither my words nor my actions ended her deep sleep. Without any warning, she stopped breathing and her body started to dissolve into a fine dust. Tap, tap, tap. I froze in place. Tap, tap, tap. I knew it was him trying to get my attention. Tap, tap, tap. But I refused to look at him. I kept my eyes closed. There was a last set of tapping and then nothing. Was he gone? I dared to look outside. He had left, but a message was there in its place. In the foggy basement window of Jess's room was a crossed out two following by a one. That's when it hit me. The three figures the man held up was the night before. It was me, Jess, and Nick. And now I was the only one left. That was a couple of hours ago. Others have joined him outside. There are about 50 people all wearing the same blank mask in front of my house. I feel like they could see me through the walls or something because wherever I go in my house, I could feel their eyes on me. I barricaded myself in my room with food and water, but I don't think it matters anymore. I searched the internet for any information that could help me. I did find some other people claiming to be stalked by people with the same blank mask. They always post once or twice about it before never writing anything again. One guy even posted a video of these people surrounding him chanting some kind of sentence over and over. People in the comments said it sounded something like, Ayad Imekovic Semasovos, Tipek Kak, Ikhrane, Ibmodo. But I have no idea what it could mean. The crowd have been saying something in unison for the last hour or so. I can't hear it well, but it sounds similar to the video I watched. I just hope my story can help someone in the future. The house just started shaking. I think whatever they are calling upon is coming. There is no hope for me. Dad. Mom. Jessica. Nicholas. I'm sorry. And I love you. Firstly, Sorry for my English. English is not my native language. So this happened in 2015. I went to a language school in England with my friend. We decided to go to Scotland on the weekend. I left the issue of arranging tour to my friend because I was no good at organization. I later realized that she was worse. While I waited for the plane or train, we took the bus at 7 in the evening. There was a girl we met there, so we were three people total. But time didn't pass. We took a toilet break in empty places, whose existence had been forgotten. I was just wandering around. After a while, we started talking about the haunting of Edinburgh Castle, ghosts, etc. 
I said that they were doing it for tourism, that there was no such thing. I made fun of them, said that they are not real. My friend told me to shut up. She is very afraid of these issues and immediately closed the topic. I knew this and I started messing with her. I made jokes. I didn't really believe and I thought that these topics were funny. We arrived in Edinburgh in the morning. Meanwhile, we had a small argument with my other friend. She wanted to go shopping, but I wanted to visit the festival and eat all Scottish food. Then, after traveling alone, I got lost there, I know. We went to the place where we were going to stay for the evening. It was a student tour anyways. I wasn't expecting anything, but things started to get interesting. Far outside of Edinburgh, there's a freaking abandoned hostel-like place in the forest. So, there is a reception in the middle of the forest. After you get your keys, you walk to the separate apartments in the forest. It's an interesting place like no other. I entered my room, an old-style wooden bed with a mosquito net, a table right next to it, a huge window on the opposite side of the bed. The forest is outside and a huge moon. The gothic movie set of a 90s movie, you know? I was going to put my things right on the table. The Bible and the cross on the table caught my eye for the moment. So I questioned myself why these are here. So there was a knock on my door. My friend came. She left her pillow and her belongings. She had already forgotten how to be offended. She started meowing, asking me if I would sleep here alone. I said yes, but she immediately took the side of the wall of the bed. So if a monster came in, it would eat me first. She wrapped herself in a quilt like a mummy and slept. I can't sleep directly. I fall asleep thinking about anything. Anyways, while I was sleeping, something like a cold breeze touched my chest, but the strange part was that the window was not open. Anyways... I ignored it and closed my eyes. Then, something stroked my hair. A hand. I jumped out and suspected it was the mosquito net first, but it was heavy and attached to the back. Then I suspected it was my friend, thought that she was trolling me. I woke my friend up. She was scared, so I didn't say anything, and then we slept. I didn't think about it at all the next day. Three days later, we returned to England. A few months later, one night I was on my phone on the bed. Then I turned off the light on my phone and started to get ready to sleep. I heard the voices of my peers from outside. There was no fear inside me. I put my phone next to the bed and turned to sleep on my back. At that moment, I saw a dark figure lying next to me. Not a shadow. Someone or something. It was shorter than me. I was definitely not asleep. I couldn't figure it out. I could have moved my hands. I could have gotten up if I wanted to. It's not a nightmare. I don't use alcohol, cigarettes, or anything else that would have any antidepressant. I wasn't using anything. I never had seen a hallucination in my life. Haven't had a delusion even once. What I was experiencing at that moment was very clear. It was real. I broke the ice and started to pray inside. I locked my eyes to the ceiling. It moved in the corner of my eye. Then that thing turned to me and started looking at me. I don't know how much time passed. It quickly disappeared towards the wall. I immediately turned on the light. I didn't think of putting on something under me. I was only wearing a t-shirt and panties. But at the moment... I took the pillow and flew away. Thank God there was nobody in the corridor. I knocked on my friend's door and slept with my friend that night. I had never told my friend what had happened that night, and yes, I had never believed in these sort of stories. But something dark was lying next to me, and I was completely sane. And I had always wondered what that thing actually was.